Okay, looking at uh, programs and apps for chapter four. And basically identifying the categories of apps, how the operating system interacts with it, and the ways you can acquire them and use them, identify the different applications and the key features of multimedia and graphics. Okay, in addition to that, we're looking at the uses of uh, personal applications you can use, personal interest, certify or identify a purpose of software communications that we use, the different types that we use for that, the features of security tools, just the overview, quick overview of security tools, and then we'll talk a little bit about disk management tools. So program or software is a series of instructions, the proper definition of it, uh, related uh, instructions, and they're organized so that they solve uh, or achieve a common purpose. Uh, algorithms, you may have heard that word a lot, okay, uh, falls into the program category and uh, tells the computer what and how to perform, okay, for the user. And uh, they range in all kinds of uh, categories and uh, levels of difficulty to use, complexity, and uh, some are very intuitive, you know, where it just kind of, no, oh, yeah, I'll do this now. Oh, I can do this now. It kind of thinks what your next step is going to be. It's been thought through a lot. And then a lot of programs are just like, blam, you know, here it is. Here's what you can do. Figure it out, you know. So AutoCAD's a little bit that way, <laughs> you know, sometimes not very intuitive. Whereas an application or an app called application software it's programs to make users more productive or assist them with personal tasks, all right? So there, it is software, it is a program, but we call it an app or an application. It's more defined and uh, makes you more productive, okay? It's kind of grown with the advent, the rollout, and use of the iPhone and smartphones, you know, with apps available. Then, of course, the operating system is needed. It coordinates all the activities. So your iPhone or your smartphone has either what, the Android system or the iOS, okay? Uh, iPhone uh, operating system. And then our PCs have uh, Windows, Microsoft Windows, they've kind of like got the corner market on that, you know. Uh, there is another operating system on, used on PCs, uh, Linux, okay, operating system. The, uh, pardon? Uh, it's, it's like uh, the feel of it, it's always in development, okay. It is open architecture, so people can contribute to it and change it for their own use, you know? It's a little more open, developer level. Yeah. The, and it's free for the most part, Linux is. It's just an operating system, okay? And then you've got to find stuff, applications that will work with it, okay? Uh, the, the 3D printer I use back there, its computer is run by Linux. It's not uh, not Windows based. Is it more graphic and imaging and stuff like that? It can be. Like I say, it's kind of like always in development, you know. Uh, a lot of people swear by it. I mean, a lot of it looks like Windows, you know. So it is something, you know, to take a look at, uh, but for business and industry and 
you know, getting up and running and having something that you don't have to fiddle with, then, you know, you're going to use windows, you know. So, uh, but it's pretty solid. I mean, that machine back there has never failed in its operation and what it's done. It's pretty simple tasks. The operating system that it's using, uh, the features of the operating system that it uses, I mean, I've, the machine is... Uh, eight years old, they've done some firmware updates to it, I've never had a problem with it, ever. All right, it's basically called the operating system is our system software. You got to have that there before you can have programs and apps. It's kind of like a duh. Programs and apps by category are listed in your book, and this is the little uh, snapshot of that breaks down into productivity like word processing and stuff graphics and media like CAD uh, then personal interest you might have a medical app entertainment stuff you know your streaming uh, application and so forth and then communications you know email blogs <clears throat> instant messaging Facebook uh, which falls over into personal interest, maybe. Security. Well, you know, the Blackboard system, it's a, it's a program. It's an app. It's a web-based program. Uh, that's the other thing, too, is the, the scale is tipped now. Uh, I mean, you know, Microsoft Office, Blackboard. I mean, just about everything is switched to web-based software so you really don't have the program fully installed on your computer anymore. You know, you got a little kernel of it. You got a little executable file or two or, you know, a smaller folder of it. And uh, so when you access it, uh, the new 2013 Microsoft Office, it's based on the web. It comes delivered to you through the web. It's, it's kind of a throwback the way I look at it. Years ago when I was first starting to use computers, you know, the PC had not been invented yet, okay? <laughs> That's how old I am. Uh, there was the mainframe computers and mini computers they were called, which looked like giant towers, you know, they were really big uh, computers uh, compared to what we have today, and, uh, but we could uh, borrow or have time sharing operations, they were called, and use uh, applications and programs on the mainframe via a terminal, which, you know, that's, that's basically what we've got now. We've got a terminal that hooks up through the internet. But back then, we didn't have the internet, so we had to have a direct connection, two-way connection, in and out, let's say, uh, between our terminal and the mainframe. So if we wanted to use a word processing, which was pretty basic back then, but it was, you know, we thought it was amazing uh, that we could type something on a TV screen, on a monitor, you know, and actually compose a letter, you know, and then be able to print it out in those uh, dot matrix printers. Anyway, let's go. Security is another category in file and disk management. So programs and apps starts with the operating system interface displayed on your screen. There's a Windows 8 display, and I apologize, the book that we're using uh, I grabbed it because everybody else that's teaching digital literacy on campus uses that, but it's Windows 8. Anyway, then the user instructs the operating system to run something. The application sends, can send print instructions, if that's what we're doing, one of the operations we're doing, to the uh, system software, okay, the operating system software. 
that's controlling the printer. And then uh, it sends the print information instructions to the, the printer. And then the printer feeds back information to the computer, which could come all the way back into the program. So all of that's interactive, back and forth. This could be also, remember, happening through the web, totally using a program on the web, on the internet, I should say, web-based. So software is available in all these different forms. I mean, try to think of something it's not touching and not involved with. It'd be easier or not. You couldn't find very many things that are it's not involved with. Just it's prolific everywhere. Then you got productivity applications. Whatever needs to be done in enterprise or building or work or school or whatever it is, there's an application of some type that's doing that and it's available for it. It kind of boils down into whether it's a database, okay, or whether it's a uh, 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 letter writing, documentation writing kind of application. So basically when we're using productivity, we're creating a project like a letter that's got to go out to all of our customers, then, uh, then that has to be edited, then it has to be formatted, okay? So when we're editing, we might be putting pictures in it, we might be putting graphics in it, uh, all types of things, and then format it, uh, you know, what we want to send it out as. We want to send it out as just a uh, picture, we want to send it out as a document, we want to send it out as a spreadsheet. Uh, the interconnectivity of across all these different program platforms now is just, it's becoming seamless. Inside of Microsoft it is, you know, you can put a spreadsheet in a Word document. And you can put that in a PowerPoint presentation. And then you could take a snapshot of PowerPoint slide and drag it over and put it into a Word document or stick it into a spreadsheet. Now a database, eh, he's kind of standing alone. You might be able to put it in an entry page kind of thing or an information page inside the, the database. And of course then saving it and distributing it through communication application. But all of that process right there might involve three or four different applications that are seamlessly connected. Microsoft Office tries to do that. They do that a lot. It gets where it gets really difficult, you know, is when you got a Mac user, Mac world, and a PC world, you know, comes together. Some of the transfer back and forth is not nice okay pictures and stuff like that they've standardized that pretty good but you know it's gotten to the point now where you can use office products on a Mac so word processing software clip art is used we have presentation software like I'm using right here uh, which is PowerPoint and then there's several others out there free ones available. Uh, Prezi is another one that's uh, web-based and you can do a lot with it for making presentations. You can even make a, uh, with Prezi you can even make a resume, uh, an animated resume. It's pretty cool. I'll have to, when we get started on Office Essentials, I'll have to show you a couple examples of it. It's pretty nice. You can turn it into a just a, an interactive show and you give your employer a link and uh, when it pops up got all these little buttons they can pick and it's all fancy graphics and they can find out basic information about you and pick on that and it pops up information you know it's kind of interactive and uh, fun you know instead of just looking over a sheet of paper or looking at electronic document 
so it's pretty cool. Of course, spreadsheet software we got basically in rows and columns. Uh, it has been around a very long time, as you've already discovered, invented by a guy named Bricklin. And uh, I didn't use his initial software, but one that's related to it called Lotus123 is where really spreadsheet just exploded in usage. And, uh, and then Microsoft took over and uh, started their own, and there was all kinds of legal battles. And Microsoft won, and now they're, you know, Excel is like the de facto standard spreadsheet software. So it gets its name from an old tried and true accounting system, uh, paper and pencil method. It was called a spreadsheet, where they do a journal analysis, you know, cost, uh, return on investment, or whatever, and, uh, you know, it was all on paper but it was rows and columns. And, uh, you know, in here we can stick a formula this long inside one cell and calculate, you know, literally millions of numbers and put the answer in one little cell. So back in the old days, on paper, they had a spreadsheet. And so if there was a number they wanted to show in there, they'd have other pages back here that they would have to manually calculate and then get the result and then stick the answer in there, you know. So that's where it comes from. It's based on the paper and pencil method. Database software, uh, it's a little more uh, virtual, I guess is what I want to say. It's a little uh, behind the scenes. You don't really, uh, when you set up a database program, for people to use, uh, the user, the end user is not seeing the records and the rows and columns of information, okay? They're seeing a screen, and you all use it all the time. Every time you use something web-based and you're ordering something or you're filling out a survey or you're submitting your application online or anything like this, it's probably using a database program where it's sucking all that information in putting it in records, uh, records being down the left-hand side. Let's see if I got a bigger display. Yeah. Uh, down the left-hand side. So everything is a record, you know, an instance, let's call it. And then across the top would be the field uh, column names, okay, that are called fields. And so for every record, like if you were doing uh, a database on recipes, you know, each record would be, you know, a different recipe. Biscuits, cake, you know, pie, whatever it might be, and then all the ingredients might be out this way. Could be a database of uh, human resources. So all of these would be record numbers, number of employees, then you'd have name, Social Security number, address, phone number, work classification, blah, 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 all the way across. And uh, so you create a database uh, of information that's held. It kind of looks like a spreadsheet. Well, guess what? You can, inside of Excel spreadsheet, create a database. Now, you can't create a spreadsheet inside of a database program. It's just not going to do it. Okay, so note-taking software, uh, mainly, I mean, it is available. Uh, this is where we can collect comments, web pages, sketches, pictures, you know, all kinds of type text, handwritten text, all kinds of stuff. So it's kind of leaning on the touchscreen thing. Uh, but it actually started before that was available. Uh, but this one here is in uh, uh, OneNote in Office 2013. So all kinds of uh, features are available that you can embed in it. Uh, all kinds of different ways to collect and store information. So it's just kind of a 
place where you can just put all your notes for stuff. And if you have an iPad, there are uh, all kinds of free ones out there that you can add, apps that you can add to take notes and capture stuff and, and put stuff. And so when you're collecting information, uh, notes about stuff, you can do it in all kinds of digital ways. Of course, calendar and contact is another way of uh, being product, improving your productivity, keeping a calendar of what you do. And, uh, you know, it's been a struggle for myself, you know, making myself use it. And, uh, but I'm so glad I'd use it now and I've got it organized. You see a little snapshot right there of, of my calendar screen. So I've got my classes and everything in there. And over there is the Google one, that's just a generic one out of your book. So uh, meetings that come up and personal things I got to do and I can, this is all available or I can look at this calendar from anywhere, you know, any of my devices, just log in to uh, Outlook. Then there's the software suite, uh, all of it working together, and uh, that would be Microsoft Office. Project management software, you'll run into this if you stay in industry long enough and you get into any kind of supervisory role, uh, you know, whether it's first level or higher, um, you know, first line level or, or higher. Uh, where you have to plan and track projects that are ongoing uh, in the facility or in your production area or whatever your area of concern is. And uh, it can be very detailed uh, where you're tracking cost and, and resources or it can be just very limited, you know, and just mainly do scheduling. But it can be used for analysis. Then, of course, accounting software that uh, is kind of a combination of spreadsheet and databases, but it's mainly a database kind of running thing. So it's really accounting software can handle all sizes, you know, through corporation. And there are some high powered ones out there. Then there is the personal finance software that you can use for your own uh, personal financing and, and uh, budget keeping, uh, tracking investments and, and so forth. You can tie it in with all your accounts and it'll keep a running balance on stuff for you and track your investments and so forth. Uh, but, you know, don't trick yourself into thinking, oh, well, I'll just get that and, man, it'll just put it, punch in a few things and I'll be done, you know. Learning curve, you know, learn how to use it and uh, hooking everything up and getting all your data put in. It's just not going to grab it out of the thin air. Legal software, uh, I've used this, SISTA uh, in preparation of legal documents before my surgery, uh, uh, prostate surgery, and then later uh, gallbladder surgery. Uh, I made uh, documents for, uh, for my wife, you know, and uh, instead of going to a lawyer, we did the uh, living will, you know, through there, through LegalZoom. And, uh, you know, it's for real. It's the real deal. It's a bona fide document. You get it uh, notarized and, you know, and it only, you know, cost me about 70 bucks. Um, but you can do all kinds of legal documents through um, the software now. Just, it's web-based, you know. You don't want to buy the legal software and start doing it yourself. But, you know, you can. I mean, there's, that's allowed in uh, state law. Of course, tax preparation software, another productivity app. Uh, more and more people, millions of people use this now, Tax Act and others, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's great. And it's free, you know. <laughs> I don't know how they do that, you know. I don't know how they make money to 
put that thing together that has to be complicated since the IRS rules are like a, a million pages or something. Ah. <laughs> All right. Then there's document management, and uh, that's grown a lot where we can uh, manage uh, revisions among departments, uh, and then in the CAD architectural mechanical area, you know, we use document management software now. Uh, instead of printing out documents, we'll send documents, uh, drawings, using the software that they have that basically allows them to be viewed and marked up and then can be sent back or can be in real time. So, There's different applications uh, that are found on desktop, mobile, and web apps. So referencing, that is finding information, you know, like the encyclopedia used to be, travel applications of all sorts, and retail applications. You're bombarded with them uh, if you watch any television. Okay, or you watch stuff online, or you online at all, you'll see all kinds of those. So in a large organization, you're going to have uh, a whole series, a, a suite of uh, software that needs to all connect in, and communicate with one another. Okay, and uh, this is huge. Uh, really started not too long after uh, computers came on the scene, okay, all these different departments. You're talking about thousands of people using hundreds of different types of software trying to communicate with one another. All the business information, somebody has to pull it together. Of course, graphics and media, we've got the CAD, AutoCAD, the world leader in uh, installations and usage of CAD software. Desktop publishing would be like the publisher system you have in Microsoft Office. Paint and image editing, uh, Photoshop and other uh, creative sources inside of Adobe and others allow that. You know, the iPhone has a lot of image editing software as well as uh, photo editing software. Then there are scads of clip art and image gallery, but now, I mean, the way Google is, you, you don't have to buy any of that. Used to, you had to, you know, go to your office supply place and buy a package of clip art, a CD, you know. So now it's just like, you need some kind of artwork or image to put in a document, you just Google image, and I mean, you know, millions thousands of artwork shows up. Then of course video and auditing uh, editing software that is uh, like what I'm using right now to record this presentation called Camtasia uh, is one. It's mainly for a lot of education purposes but there are tons of video and audio editing software that is replaced a room full of hardware, you know, where you can just feed it in through a USB port or a video card and literally, I'm serious, just replace the whole wall of hardware that you used to have to have to do some kind of recording. You know, if you wanted to do a professional uh, music recording, now you can do it with uh, all the audio editing software that's out there. Quite incredible. So multimedia, you know, it's dealing with text, graphics, audio, video, and animation. And it, that is interactive. Uh, 3D Studio made by Autodesk. 
uh, led the way in that for the PC years ago, and they still continue to, to be a leader. A lot of the first animation movies you saw in the theater used 3D Studio. More and more of that is used. And then, of course, website authoring. You've got to now, you know, if you're not on the web, you don't really exist. You know, it's going to be tough for you to do commerce, uh, yeah, do business if you're not on the web. So there's all kinds of web authoring. And uh, it's built into a lot of uh, Microsoft Office product. <coughs> then there's several different media players and basically allows you to watch, listen to audio, and uh, that looks like the, I don't know what the real player maybe that one is, I don't know. There's several different kinds out there, of course iTunes, uh, if you hook your phone to your PC then it wants to be the one that does everything for you in this category. Then you can buy additional disk burning software separate from anything iTunes does where you can do custom stuff on your own and uh, make your own uh, disk but you know now everything is on the web and uh, making a DVD or a CD you know that's going by the wayside you just don't see it you might find it on a junk drive you know, on a USB drive as uh, far as something external. But now, if you can't hook up to the web with some kind of device, then you probably are not going to be able to uh, create a project and, uh, and share it. Then personal interests have a wide range of lifestyle apps, medical apps, entertainment, convenience, and then education apps like our Blackboard learning system and there's two or three of those out there that different uh, universities and systems use. So in communications it ranges from blogging and browsing and email and chat rooms, uh, instant messaging, uh, messenger in Facebook, uh, web fees, uh, VOIP, which is voice over internet protocol. That's what all of our phone systems here in the college use, VOIP, the phone in the room. It's connected through the internet. Uh, and now it's actually connected through uh, Skype as Microsoft bought Skype out and incorporated it into their, yeah, Outlook system uh, about two years ago and they didn't do anything for a little bit and then they got absorbed it all and they got rid of their link system and now they use Skype and so I can pull up Skype it it loads up I mean that's what we use to communicate with and uh, video conference uh, with it and also I can make phone calls from my computers just right up here from my laptop or from anywhere I'm connected okay so all kinds of uh, communication methods are available now. And uh, back when I first started using computers, uh, we could do our bulletin board communication. That was basically 1,200 baud modem maybe or 600 baud, okay? And, uh, you know, we could type a message and send it to another person and they could, uh, which was just a text-based screen, nothing graphic, and then uh, they might reply at some point, you know, but you could uh, put stuff out there on the bulletin board and uh, share files as well. And that's actually how you'll learn a little later when we study CAD, that's actually how AutoCAD was created through a bulletin board system of programmers communicating. Personal firewall, we're talking about security tools now. Uh, you know, in any operating system, Microsoft, 
operating system and Mac uh, OS you know firewalls are built in for your protection and uh, you also have firewalls that come with hardware like your uh, routers your Wi-Fi routers your cable modem your DSL modem they have firewalls built in and uh, it basically protects uh, the data from someone unwanted something unwanted from coming in to your system okay uh, and uh, wreaking havoc on your computer then anything that you've got uh, that can uh, basically be hidden inside of a program or a file uh, there's a virus scanning software that's gotten very very efficient a lot of times working in the background constantly you don't even know it used to you know it would just it would be so annoying because it would just slow down your operation so much uh, you know I'd end up turning it off just so I could get something done and then I'd end up with a stupid virus and uh, <coughs> so uh, <clears throat> everything can be scanned and uh, checked for uh, viruses and uh, eliminated quarantined or actually deleted spyware <clears throat> can come in through uh, many different communication forms uh, usually while you're online uh, there can be adware though that uh, in different types of uh, malware we call it that can stay in your computer and just hibernate there for a while and uh, pick up your keystrokes you don't even know it's doing it stores that information and then at the appropriate time when you're back on the web it dumps that to the crooks that are uh, trying to get your information and uh, yeah and I'm sure that the uh, government is good at doing that too sometime you know I'll tell you all about the um, experience my brother had where he was uh, the FBI had him working for them uh, to help them capture some uh, human traffickers in Louisville it's uh, pretty amazing what he saw some of the stuff you see on CSI and stuff like that yeah they got it <laughs> he got to see it firsthand it was, he says pretty amazing anyway spyware removers basically a program that finds that detects that somehow and can remove it or delete it disable it same thing for adwares there's filters you know to keep uh, kids uh, maybe yourself from different types of things that you don't shouldn't be looking at you don't want to look at you don't want to see anti-spam keep from advertisements coming in uh, those are really difficult uh, to prevent at times and then uh, yeah, they come into your email spam does I mean we've got some of the tightest filtering and antivirus and spyware and everything else anti this anti that on, on our systems I don't I don't know but they it'll yeah and it'll catch it. it I mean I have you know a junk folder that it throws it in it does find it but occasionally it gets through how come you can get viruses on your computer but you seem to never get a virus on a tablet like this? well the iPhone or a tablet or iPad or whatever like that uh, they are the way the operating the way I was told the operating system on it it's more difficult to store something in it you know and uh, also believe it or not there's more computer still more computer users you know that's easier to 
access. So it's just it's just like the Mac has not really been felt the brunt of this kind of stuff like the PC because right. there's not as many Mac users. Right. So they're not wasting their time. Sure, you know. The crooks go for easy free. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And I think also it's just, it, the Mac system being totally proprietary. There's just not a lot of information. It's not like PC that's really open-ended, open architecture, you know. Uh, fishing filters, those are very difficult uh, to run, to uh, they're, they're still get through. We still get those. People fake emails, and it, it could be from somebody you know it looks like, you know, and I need this information so I can do this. You know, or their, you know, your uh, credit card has been uh, violated. We need uh, you to confirm your uh, credit card information. Oh, okay, man, I don't want that to happen. So you log into there and it looks bona fide. You give them all your information. They've got it, you know. Pop-up blockers, that's working really good now. I mean, you know, that's in all the browsers. It works good. You turn that on, it catches them. Apparently, that was uh, must have been an easy thing to to solve. File managers of all types, uh, whether it's you're trying to manage just the operating system. I mean, it comes built into the operating system, but you can purchase other file management tools that are just for photos. You know, and uh, there's some Google apps that uh, can do that. Of course, search tools, Google, Yahoo, Bing, are different programs or apps that do that. Then various types of viewers are available. Most of it's built in to your operating system. Now, disk cleanup, and I know I'm running short on time here, but if you can bear with me for just give me four extra minutes. Uh, disk cleanup, basically, uh, when it's doing this, when you run this uh, disk cleanup operation inside of uh, Windows operating system, uh, and it's saying how much space you'll be able to free up, well, uh, there are all kinds of temporary files and memory files and different things that are used one time when you're doing installation, when you're doing di different operations, and they just get left. They get left behind, and so they can be identified and then removed. Uh, another process to not necessarily gain a lot of space back, but you get some, is called defragmenting. And defragmenting basically uh, operates like this. When uh, you first save or first start uh, create a computer with uh, operating system and applications, and it's all f freshly loaded up, you've just bought it. If you could see a map of the hard drive, and this is greatly enlarged, okay, because they're very, very microscopic uh, slices, okay, and uh, basically logically, the uh, the disk drive is divided up into these pie shapes, okay. Now those look like different sizes of sectors the way they've drawn that thing, but they're all the same size uh, in each ring, okay. And so uh, they're not. Uh, it's not a spiral. Okay, like a CD or a DVD is a spiral, like a, an old vinyl record, okay, CD is, but a hard drive is not. So when it first starts out, it's all, all the files are nice connected end to end, in series with each other, and uh, everybody's happy. Then you delete something. You do that uh, disk cleanup. You delete files and pictures and different things and it'll leave holes. Well, then you go and you save stuff and temporary files are saved to the disk and 
uh, it'll find those holes first and put the data in those holes. Okay? Now you're, it knows though where the start and end of that file is. So this could be where it's pointing here, three different locations. That could all be the same file, but they're all in different sectors. They're not nice, nicely uh, connected in series. So a disk fragmenter will go and find those and reassemble it and get them all nice packed together end to end so they're not fragmented and therefore it can find those in a quicker way and also you get back a little bit of space because it's divided up into sectors okay and it a lot of times we'll just stick a file in that sector and there still be a little bit of room left and it'll go to the next sector Okay, so that's what's happening physically, all right? And it helps it do, uh, run a little bit faster, although i tell you the truth, uh, the way the high speed these drives run at anymore, and then if you buy the new computers that have the solid state drives in them, you don't have this problem. You know, there's no way to defragment those. All right, I'm gonna be quiet. That's all for today. We will see you guys next week. Call me or text me or email me if you got any questions about anything in the course or what you're to do. Is there any way to get that PowerPoint to like review that? Because I know we have the book and everything, but that's just like, the book's like 30 pages, something like that. So that's yeah, I can do that. That sums it up a little better. I can do that. You can just post it or something. Like yep. On chapter four of the content. Sure. Something really easy to review. Yep. And, the, and of course, the, the, the video will be on there, too, tomorrow. Oh.